Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our webinar. Uh, we're going to give it a couple minutes just for everybody to join in. Uh, so just be patient. If you're having any technical issues, please be sure to share your comments in the chat or in the questions pane within GoToWebinar. Uh, we'll, our team will do our best to kind of troubleshoot any issues you may be having. But um, we'll be starting in a few minutes, just letting a few more people roll in. And uh, thank you very much. All right, I see a lot of people coming in right now. Just um, again, just uh, initial announcements. Uh, we'll be starting the webinar shortly, uh, allowing a few more attendees just to come on in. If you have any questions during the webinar, please, please feel free to uh, post them in the questions pane or in the chat. Uh, anything else, you know, any kind of technical issues, that also will go in the chat. Uh, we'll be starting shortly in the next, I'd say, one or two minutes. Thank you. Okay, I think we are ready to begin. Uh, thank you all for attending Transformative Architecture, presented by C.P. Joyce, uh, Chief Technology Officer for Fulcrum Digital. I will be emceeing this webinar. My name is Chris Vaccaro. I am the Marketing and Account Manager here at Fulcrum Digital. Uh, so again, thank you all for uh, joining. Just to give you a little bit of background, if you're not familiar with Fulcrum Digital, we are a full-service IT company specializing in digital transformation, managed innovations, and platforms. Uh, we are headquartered in Jersey City with multiple offices across Asia, Europe, and South America. And um, of course, you know, being a global company, we have a global CTO who is CP Joyce, who, as the title screen will show you, prefers to go by CJ. Uh, so CJ, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, good morning uh, to everyone. Uh, thanks, uh, Chris, for uh, making the introduction and getting this started. Uh, thanks, everyone, for making the uh, the meeting. Uh, we really are delighted to have you here. Uh, this has been in, in the plan for a while, so I'm happy the day is here to talk about it. And uh, um, a little bit of my background, just uh, shortly. Uh, I've spent 30, 31 years in uh, technology now, uh, basically a software engineer. And then through varying roles in uh, in IT, as anyone typically goes through, have been through various aspects of IT. Uh, the predominant chunk of my experience lies in uh, two industries, uh, some in others too, uh, commercial aviation and uh, education, higher education. And 50%, uh, I think, of my career uh, has been in consulting itself, and the other 50%, uh, I think, is in corporate roles, and almost an even split not by design, but that's the way it's always uh, worked out. Uh, you know, I've been in Fulcrum now for over, I believe, nine to 10 months. It's coming up on 10 months, I think. And uh, I used to be, at one point in time, a, a client of Fulcrum many years ago. And this role is a an opportunity for me to come in and do something on the other side back in consulting. So uh, that's myself. And uh, 
the topic today essentially uh, is not one that's easy to talk about in general. Uh, there is there are no hard lines uh, with perspective to the architecture discussion. Uh, typically, they're very blurry. Uh, it's also uh, multiple uh, aspects, views, and elements that go into architecture. So there's never a good, uh, perfect answer or a really bad answer. There's always something that happens to work out for the need at hand. Uh, hence, I always preface my discussions on architecture by stating that uh, any discussion at any point in time in the, in the architecture world uh, ends up becoming more of a collaborative choice than it is uh, a hard and fast you know, rule around which something gets built. But all that said, and before I dive into, I only have very few slides here, in fact. Uh, I'll warn you, I don't have a whole bunch of slides. I'm going to describe uh, more of my experiences with some anchor slides. And to make it meaningful for you, uh, what we have tried to do is I'm doing a tag team presentation with uh, one of my colleagues and uh, uh, my team members, Alex, was also on the phone uh, about halfway through this presentation. Uh, we will hand off to Alex to walk us through some of the work Fulcrum is doing uh, as really being a substantial asset uh, to, in fact, the topic we have on hand, which is transformation and architecture's role in transformation. So back to the topic itself, the the nature of this discussion could take you know any and many dimensions. But today we are here now trying to stay focused on does architecture have a role in transformation? And if so, what is that? Why is it important, in fact, to address the architectural concerns first and position ourselves on a foundation of, uh, of flexibility before we start addressing systems, applications, code, uh, adopting new programming platforms, uh, styles of programming, and or revamping technical stack components uh, in a hurry to get to, to the end state? And the, the topic has come up, in fact, because I get asked this question multiple times. And as many times I've been to transformation myself, my the predominant majority of my career actually has been devoted to the study and implementation of transformations. I'm somewhere deeply uh, interested, passionate, and uh, challenged in um, uh, you know in my mind when I see ecosystems that are out of control, portfolios that have developed a whole sense of entropy and need correction. But naturally, there's a fiscal side to all of this. It's never a slam dunk exercise, and there's never enough money to do everything we want to do, nor is there enough time to do everything we want to do when we want to get it done. So transformations are, in my mind, the classic analogy of uh, uh, you know, a two-lane highway, and uh, you want to pass the car in front of you, and you have only one choice. You make up your mind and you step on the gas pedal and complete that pass quickly, or else you're going to end up in a crash. And so uh, being on the left lane, uh, if, if you're in America, that is, being on the left lane, on the opposite lane, trying to pass the car in front of you on a two-lane highway is uh, my typical assessment of transformations typically that have been in and have seen happen, have been through this multiple times. You either make the decision to make it done and complete it within a, you know, a span of time that's reasonable, or else they typically start unraveling over time. So the the whole notion of architecture's role in transformation comes about just because of that notion. It's uh, foundationally, I think, uh, based on having flexibility in your core. If you don't, then essentially anything you do in the periphery may be possible. For some time, it could be sustainable. But longer term, even medium term, it does unravel and come apart pretty quickly. So moving on to the next slide, to talk about transformation. Uh, you see, and I don't take any credit for these pictures, uh, I've taken them because they they are relevant, and uh, there's a historic foundation to architecture, not a new term to any one of us, and uh, definitely you can see architecture that stands in front of us, especially in some parts of uh, you know Western Europe and Eastern Europe, you in fact would see some of these, or even in India for that matter, in Asia, you see many, many architectural elements that have withstood the test of time. and the one thing that's guaranteed is that without resilience, I don't think any architecture stands the test. So architecture typically is considered to be blueprinting. You know, we draw something out to give us our sense of what we want to go accomplish. 
But as far back as you know, it could date the term, the architecture term itself, the historic foundations of uh, the concept of architecture. There is as much that it achieves in progress and growth. So it really doesn't hold you back if you did it correctly. You could accomplish you know, beautiful things on one side while still retaining elements of uh, of strength and foundational uh, and foundational competence within inside the blueprint. Next slide. <clears throat> The, I don't believe there's any introduction needed to the term itself, but what I've seen typically happen is the way it's used, I think, is where uh, its power comes from. You could either use something to serve as a, as a, as an, you know, as a catalyst to progress, or it could become the, the, the most serious drawback and the, the limitation that an architecture uh, could present to any ecosystem. And I'm talking buildings, it could apply to software, it could apply to uh, you know, mechanical construction, bridge construction. There are enough and more disasters that we have known that have come across uh, as a result of poor architecture. And there are enough successes that we see that have withstood the test of time and continue to do so. So there is really no need to discuss what poor architecture can do uh, you know, we perhaps should be talking about how do you get to better architecture and what does it do in the world of transformation. Next slide. What are we living with today? And most businesses, I think we used to say businesses before, but I think personally and professionally, most people are living in this in this realm today. Uh, what used to be enterprise, a corporate reality, I think is as much a personal reality today than, than it's ever been in the past. But these are some of the terms that immediately come to mind when you think about what is the realm we live in today. Everyone's seeking to accelerate, do things faster. You know, change is the norm almost. Nothing stays stable. The velocity of change, in my mind, is the biggest uh, uh, shift that's occurred. Things are changing faster. And uh, the sustenance of anything we produce, I think, is quickly eroding. I don't think much things last uh, for any length of time that's even reasonable. Before you bat your eyelid, uh, something has changed in the environment, and it's happening faster and faster. So naturally, the term agility has become the buzzword as much as you know, it's used. It's also misused, perhaps overused, and um, not correctly used either. And so... Ideas are the way to go after them. And so there's no shortage of ideas either. I think plenty of ideas in the works. In most, in most places you will hear, hey, we want to do this or we want to do that. So there's no shortage there of ideas. But what's needed then is how do you prove the right ones to make sure they're really worthy of, uh, of taking to you know, industry strength, uh, production quality outcomes, and those that are not, that be left behind. So that leads us then to, if we did prove the idea, if we understood it was valuable and we filtered it, you want to get to prototyping the concept uh, over and beyond proofing the concept. You have something built that tells you it's worth doing, and now you want to go implement it. For all of this to happen, uh, the struggle that we have seen as, as consultants, we have seen as consulting firms, and we have seen as corporates, in fact, is that the ideas are plenty. The intent is genuine, so it's, there's no lip service to it in most places. Change is the norm, and we truly want to be agile. But there is something that's not working. There is, a, there is something limiting us. There is uh, stuff that comes in the way, and there are more constraints than anyone can deal with. And these are not just execution constraints. I mean, what typically appears as a symptom of this root cause is that projects don't go well. Projects are slow. Or halfway through a project, we discover something can't be done. Or we try to work around it, and in the process, create more technical debt. There's more code sometimes when before a transformation starts, you baseline a code base of any enterprise. Uh, the number of times you'll see the code base has actually increased during and after the transformation is done uh, is not small. During the transformation, if a code base increases, if there is more in the stack than before, if you're spending a little bit more in, in a transient period, that's not unusual. It's bound to happen when you're trying to go through change while you know, the airplane is flying. But if you have a little bit more uh, weight or drag after a transformation is done, if at all the transformation gets done, then that's not a good signal. In fact, it's a red flag. But that's happening very often. And that's because of the reasons that we have caught ourselves caught up in. Portfolios and complexity are extremely limiting, and they are the reasons why some of the terms on this slide 
actually don't bear fruit in the way they were planned to bear fruit. I'm not saying that they never bear fruit. Many places, there is a short-term win. But longer term, we have incurred more, we have spent more, and we continue to have to sustain more. That's, in, in effect, the reality. Next slide. So this is a sample, and I have, I have seen so many of these in my my life that it doesn't surprise me anymore. But uh, and by the way, th this reality here is one of a three four transformation complete situation. So what should have ended up as three or four blocks of clean componentry, uh, and this is only a slice of a small portion of the portfolio. But you can see how many more wires have gotten connected. And nothing here actually looks to be a simplistic version of what it needed to be. So this is not uncommon, by the way. And there are plenty of uh, plenty of anecdotal examples one can take around uh, these types of outcomes. This is pre, post, uh, you know, pre, during, and post transformation. And if it comes up to a situation like this, post transformation, that indeed says a lot about what we ended up transforming or how we went about doing it. The reasons for this could not, you know, may not be few. There may be many reasons, and some of them may be real, and they could be genuine, in fact, and uh, maybe not easily resolvable. So I'm not attributing any, you know, any blame. I'm not pointing to where this could have happened or why this could have happened. But if this does happen, and it does happen actually, then definitely the, the transformation hasn't gone to where it needed to go to. So if you head to the next slide uh, uh, for me. When we observe the summary of the situation we are in, one of the things we find is that IT portfolios in general are basically in conflict as much as they are pervasive. They are in every aspect of uh, technology portfolios in general, I would say, even beyond IT and enterprise IT technology portfolios and technology components are in you know in a pervasive way in every part of human life uh, and definitely corporate and business life you know is a big part of that uh, the objectives of the business are right there i mean we want to achieve more and we need uh, to be agile in the marketplace new product introductions cost optimization revenue growth uh, operations excellence employee satisfaction uh, customer satisfaction these are all core drivers of uh, what a company should be focused on, and most companies are. But there are serious limitations. And when you look at portfolios, the history of IT portfolios especially, anything to do with software, just pick out the, the nature of software itself, which is so intangible to the human eye, other than seeing a line of code or, or a program, you don't see a physical tangible object. So the clutter is not visible. And once clutter isn't visible, Entropy can result really fast. It actually grows in leaps and bounds. And with everyone touching any line of code every day, and by the way, it's happening every day, uh, we're only adding perhaps more complexity and the lack of hygiene to things that are already there. This growth doesn't take much time. They grow really rapidly, especially in scenarios where you're forced to, in fact, address market needs. Uh, there is a customer waiting out there. There are uh, There's a market full of opportunity to go after. To build and deliver is the goal, and there are good intentions, in fact, and so we do. But with everything that we put out there, if there is no planned sunset, if there is no rule to say goodbye to what's in the portfolio, they continue to exist. And this is how the 10, 15 years of a portfolio, you find that it's so interwoven it's very hard to separate them out. It's very hard to cleanse them. It's very hard to introduce any hygiene. And not only that, they become limiting for what we produce in the future. If they're only restricted to being the way those, those components were, those systems were, those aspects were, well, I think we would be okay. Uh, it's at least uh, we're stemming the bleed and it's right where it's needed to be, perhaps, for some part of the pain that we live with. And we you know, disregard most of it as much as we can address it as we could. But when they start seeping into becoming limitations for the future, then it becomes a serious and a dangerous problem. And most of the assignments that you know, I've dealt with, either as a corporate member or as a consultant partner, this is where we end up entering into the picture. The call is always to say, we want to go construct this. Can we do this? At that time, we find out, uh, yes, we could do it, but these are all the limitations. The list of limitations far exceeds the list of opportunities or, or advantages many times. So to work around each one of them, 
is the goal. And then in working around each one of them, we introduce new complexity. Uh, software has changed over the years. Uh, the nature of writing code has changed over the years. Components and component-based engineering has been a concept, not a complete concept yet, because if you look at the whole topic of reuse in the software world, you will find a whole bunch of people who talk about it. I am one of them, and I think it is the uh, holy grail that we should get to uh, reusable components so that we're not rewriting stuff and we can reuse them as and when we have produced one. But unlike a nut or a bolt, it's very hard to say it's standardized. Therefore, it's you know it's metric as units, and so you know we could plug it in; it should fit right there. The discussion around standards, I think, is absolutely there, but there we're far from where we need to be, and partly driven by the industry itself. Stuff changes in the technology world so rapidly; standardizing can happen when you know something will stay for a while. So we're struggling with that too. But in the end, what it all boils down to from our experience at Fulcrum, from my personal experience in this, in this space, and from noticing where some of the scars on my back you know, I've incurred, I've incurred them only because there is, there is deficiency, there is rigidity, there is a lack of flexibility in the core, which basically is architect architectural. And when I talk of architecture here and going forward, uh, this definition of architecture here is more at the enterprise level. It's about interoperability. It's about you know, collaborative software components. It's about using what's available. It's about not reinventing the wheel. And this flexibility comes at a much higher level than software architecture inside a piece of code or the use of patterns with inside code itself to make it far more standard. Um, this is at a, at a level or two higher where all this begins. And you can view architecture as being an abstraction top down, or you can see it as a foundation at the bottom and therefore bottoms up. But essentially, uh, whichever way you view the picture, flexibility in the core, the underlying strata, is where the, the, the story actually begins. I've been in too many engagements where we have tried to build flexibility on top, only to find that all of our efforts are pretty much limited or somewhat uh, compounded in complexity because the core isn't uh, lending itself to, to, the, to the task at hand. In trying to circumvent some of that rigidity, well, all the so-called flexibility we were trying to build on top to cope with the velocity of change that occurs in the marketplace is basically uh, almost decimated, uh, uh, undermined, or nullified in some, in some cases. I'm not new to where engagements have gone in my prior life where we have ended up with a little bit more than we had before, and therefore anything we got in as a business case from a fiscal and you know, a financial economic standpoint was pretty much uh, almost destroyed because of some of the limitations we discuss. Next slide. CJ, before we move to the next slide, we have a question from the audience. Uh, so I think it's, uh, we should stay on this slide for now until this question is uh, addressed. Um, so in this era of digital business platforms, does it need a completely different approach to architecture to make an IT organization future-proof and resilient? It's a, it's, a, it's a fine question. I was going to go address that, in fact, uh, in the upcoming slides, but I'll answer it. In, in, my, in my world, in the way I look at it, uh, without sounding uh, uh, too out of the realm here, I would say yes. I would say different is a relative word in itself, a completely different uh, architecture. But I think whoever asked the question, you're spot on. If the thought process is not completely different, Maybe the resulting architectural construct is not 100% uh, throw away everything from the past and live with something new. That's not needed. I don't think the principles from the past need to be thrown away. In fact, if we adhere to some of the principles from architecture, uh, as old as they are, I think we'll be better off. But definitely in the world we're living in, what you call a digital uh, marketplace, a uh, digital you know, ecosystem, the Internet of Things, connected appliances, everything talks to everything else, overloaded networks, uh, packet sizes being what they are, address spaces on the Internet going away almost. We're trying to struggle with IPv6 now. We're struggling basically in, in the world of um, uh, digitization. So yes, it does uh, require a different thought process, Principles, I think, could be drawn from the past and reused, but with a different motto, a different motive, 
and a different approach to the construct that actually becomes a physical, tangible asset. But absolutely, uh, I don't you want to say, you know, yes, entirely in capitals, because people will say, what is that different thing? And why are we throwing away everything from the past? And is it even practical to throw away what we got and start from new? So being a realist, and just not being a consulting partner, having led these portfolios myself, I've known of the struggles anyone in a in an IT organization role plays and and faces. Whether it's the CIO, the CTO, you know, you know program managers, uh, change uh, specialists, innovation folks, uh, but everyone has good ideas. Naturally, are constrained by what they got. There is not much of a choice to throw away everything we got and start from scratch. But the mindset absolutely can shift. Right this moment, the mindset can shift to talking transformation on a daily basis, to talking flexibility on a daily basis. Dexterity becomes the word to go forward with. And then one thing I'll mention, and I'll stop with this on this response, is not too long ago, we were struggling with trying to fit in the code and optimize the code to fit into you know, uh, two kilobytes of memory. And I've written code to do that, and I'm some dating myself here, maybe. But I have none of those struggles. Today, we have the exact opposite problem. We have the ease to throw more resources at a problem. And so what used to be a beautiful limitation in my mind, which was you had to deal with constraints and limitations around resources, both compute and non-compute resources. Today, we have the ease to say, oh, let's throw some more memory at it. Oh, to you know, throw some more you know, hard drive space at it. Or go to the cloud, it's cheaper to buy it on a utility model. All of these uh, lovely luxuries that we have today are perhaps driving portfolios to becoming what they're becoming, which is more complex and less efficient and less optimal. All right, so then we've talked about the need for transformation. We talked about what it means or why why the requirement for transformative architecture and maybe even discuss the, discuss the topic of architecture does play a role in transformation. Without that role being satisfied, anything else we do is perhaps going to be limited or partly mitigated right there. So what then is transformative architecture characterized by? And you can label this any which way you want. I call it transformative architecture. Some of the words right on the screen here. We want autonomy. We need simple extensibility models. We absolutely need uh, standalone uh, components to serve the need while being you know, encompassed in containers and so, so forth. Aggregation is the norm. I mean, there's, if you type up any word for any business functionality today or technical capability today on the internet, you'll find uh, half a million results, if not more, for most things. There are at least hundreds and hundreds of results that come up for any component you look for, be it something really, really complicated in the data science space, uh, be it a statistical model, be it the use of artificial intelligence or machine learning models in running test algorithms, uh, talk of uh, deterministic processes on the other side used to predict the future, not query, but predict uh, the future, so use, the real use of big data then, uh, the pursuit of agility, in not only delivering products to customers, but serving them better. Acceleration, which everyone talks about, but few of us know what to do when it comes to, so how then do I really accelerate anything? And of course, with extensibility comes plug and play. And that means we are in a good position to unplug the fuel injector on the car today and replace it with a new one. So long as the standards are met, it should plug right in without any issues. Uh, likewise, with any other part in an automobile or an airplane or a, a part at home, you unplug a three-pin plug and you can plug in another three-pin plug into the socket, it should work. Seamlessness is what we're all seeking. So we stop writing custom code every morning, day, afternoon, and night, hoping it'll work, and then having to look at the technical debt we created through the process. So when it comes down to architecture, if we came to a point where we could characterize it this way, and in everything we did thereafter to populate our architecture with any component or home written code, but they adhere to some of these principles, and we should elaborate on these principles you know when we had undertaken uh, when we undertake the responsibility of moving forward with the transformative architecture but this these are some of the characteristics that define and qualify an architecture that will help cope with change. What are we trying to do? We're trying to stay ahead of the curve. We're trying to do away with the crystal ball everyone was trying to look into not too long ago, hoping to see the best way to do something through the crystal ball. 
We are trying to build ourselves a foundation that regardless of what appears in front of us, we have the ability to cope with change in a, in a really minimalistic, uh, minimal cost, minimal effort type manner, which means if a fuel injector does go bad, we're not unplugging the whole engine and having to throw it away or build another fuel injector on our own, hoping to meet the standard. But be able to buy one, buy a component off the shelf, knowing it'll do its job, and plug it straight back in. Does it look like some uh, uh, Star Trek scenario for technology? Uh, I believe some of it does. I would have said it looked like that entirely about five, seven years ago. Not anymore today. I think with the availability of containers and uh, you know, Kubernetes and Dockers and the ability to run business functionality within boxes, uh, cloud-hosted scalability that we could truly make elastic as needed if the application was engineered for scalability, I think these are all coming to become reality. I would not completely say that we are there today, but we are definitely getting there. So in having seen this and having performed many, many, many engagements, both personally and as Fulcrum as a company, we have typically addressed these kinds of transformations as Fulcrum on a project by project, program by program. Some of them mean multi-year, multi-million dollar, multi-objective programs. But those are last, large scopes of work that a company takes on and we partner with them to help them get through it. But doing it one at a time, there's been so much learning. Our answer to solving this in at least a partial way, this is our contribution to the world that I've just described, comes up on the next slide. We have gone ahead and put together what we call Fulcrum One. It's a, it's a solution, it's an accelerator, it's actually a, a, an answer to transformation, it's an answer to transformative architecture, it's an answer to you know, dexterity, flexibility, you know, removing and decomplexing uh, rigidity out of portfolios, reducing costs, you know, making sure sunsets are, are done so that we're truly saying goodbye to stuff that we don't keep anymore rather than just leave them there and have them consume not only money but time and attention. But Fulcrum One is basically Fulcrum's answer to taking all these principles, all the stuff we have spoken about in the past 29 minutes, and then come to a point where we can offer something that once placed in, in, in position can be configured and opened up opportunistically. So it's not an all or nothing, you know, oh, just one day we cut over everything into production kind of deal, but slowly but surely it it falls in line with the whole thought process uh, to the question that was asked of a digital mindset and, and a transformation to get to the, the world that, uh, that this current context of digitization actually is forcing everyone into, whether you're a consumer or a provider. Uh, that's where we all need to end up inevitably. And we'll either end up there through pain or through proactive positioning. And so this is our method to saying through proactive positioning, if you were to place something in there, you know we can open it up one at a time, but every step you take in that direction takes you away from rigidity and forces architectural flexibility at the same time allows you to build on top of a strong foundation. I'll just make one more line of a statement. I'm going to hand off to my colleague here to show you what Fulcrum One is all about in a very summarized way. It's far too big to, to talk in even an hour's time, but it will give you a summary of what's inside it. Uh, the, the whole notion of architecture is very difficult to discuss. It's so nebulous. Uh, it's always been so, it's, it's, at least in the, in, the, in the blueprinting world, we used to draw some diagrams, but the more agile, which is why I use the term overuse of agile as a term or the misuse of it, the more agile I see in any place, the lesser respect I see for anything to do with writing down a design or coding to a standard. The whole goal becomes, let's just sprint our way to some outcome. And I realize the Agile Manifesto talks about code being the only asset, but nowhere in the manifesto does it ever say, discard the notion of thought process, discard thinking and design, and make sure you're actually architecting and designing for an extensible outcome. But that's what is the result, though, in running fast. We are leaving behind some of this. Fulcrum 1 is supposed to enforce uh, architectural constructs in a way that are not in the way, but allow for the flexibility to be present while also not destroying any levels of agility when it comes to delivering outcomes. So it's a nebulous discussion and uh, architecture is an, an artifact. People have asked me, is it, a, is it a thing? Is it a concept? Is it an outcome? Is it a result? Is it a deliverable? I think it's a little of all of it and it can take, it should take on the level of detail that's required to make it real for the context at hand. There is no, there are some things such as views and positions, you know, systems, and uh, there's so many 
frameworks to use. We don't need to get bogged down by all of that. But in the end, yes, architecture needs to be depicted. You need to know where the plumbing is going to go in a home. You have to know where the wiring is going to go. You've got to know where the spans and the columns will rest. Otherwise, you'll have uh, the Seattle-Tacoma you know, Narrows Bridge uh, being constructed and then being found out to be a little too short. So you must have something that actually can come in the way of helping construct, but also to make sure we remember our decisions as we create them. So Alex, I'm going to hand off to you, and uh, Chris will, uh, and I'll take questions in the end. We're trying to leave about 10, 12 minutes for questions in the end. So it's 10, 35 central. So Alex, 15, 18 minutes for you, and uh, Chris has got the control on the slide deck. Okay, thank you, CP. Yes, so uh, Fulcrum One is a foundational framework and it allows business-driven architecture. So it accelerates development, it allows you to reuse your components and allows you to install new components without the need to code. I'm going to show to you how we have uh, designed this platform to do so. So let's go to the next slide and some of the acceleration features, okay? So it also generates functionality, base functionality. So when you create a new entity, let's say clients, it creates the tables, it creates the APIs, and you're able to use these APIs to do integrations with other software in your corporation or even to use to integrate with other entities. It also creates uh, the visual interfaces, if that's the case, sometimes you want to create entities that don't have a visual interface, but if you need visual interfaces, you can select your templates, your styles, and it generates the, the pages for you. Uh, it is a code-free custom solution deployment. So even developers, they don't need to code. They can create a plugin, and that plugin is installed into, into Fulcrum One. So it is, we are going to show how the plugin works in a few slides. We have also a style builder. So if you wanna do your own branding, if you wanna have different versions of uh, templates for your functionalities, you can build those styles on your own. We have a business rules engine module where developers and business users are able to create uh, custom workflows just like you do on a BPM N2, we have a BPM2 online, but you can also use an offline BPM N2, such as Bizagi or Camundo or other tools, and you upload, you can deploy your processes into our workflow engine. And you can make, so the entities trigger those workflows and those workflows, and those workflows can also trigger other workflows and you can manage that online. We have a messages and notifications module that allows you to customize your messages so you can use in your, all your custom functionalities or products acquired by Fulcrum. Uh, we have an administration module that allows, uh, if you wanna enable products, you are able to manage uh, products, licenses, and tenants in there. The next slide, please. Okay, so here we have an example on how one of the core modules interact with Fulcrum One. So we have uh, the business layer on the left and those are the functionalities available for the business. So you are able to manage your user groups, your, your users, permissions, the navigations, if you wanna create new pages, if you wanna create new content, if you wanna create uh, a simple CRUD uh, operation style for an entity, if you want to create new entities and manage your workflows, we have that layer for the business. All the APIs are also available. If you don't want to use those functionalities within Fulcrum One, but you want to, you want to use the API to integrate and retrieve data or put data into Fulcrum One, you have access to the API layer on the API gateway. Those, uh, the data is stored on our data layer and we have a business data lake where the data from the entities are kept on the business data lake and all the configurations are kept on a separate database. So configurations data, they are not mixed with business data. Uh, 
we have an authentication layer. It, it's an, uh, an access and manage, management layer. You are able to configure to connect to any type of different federation. So if your company uses uh, Google Business, if you use Azure, you configure it, and you, now you have single sign-on in Fulcrum 1, enabling that single sign-on even to other, other applications in your corporation if you, wanna, if you wanna use this module in Fulcrum 1 as your single sign-on manager. So on the right, we have a core module. On this core module, we manage uh, tenants, licenses, products, reports, and administrators, but all the core modules are connected through the API gateway uh, component. So any core module, and this is when the flexibility that CP mentioned comes. So we have all the core modules together connected to the API layer, and this is where the integration between the core modules happen. Next slide, please. So this is how the core modules are deployed. So we have on the right, each core module independent has its own database in a Docker container, its own application and database in a Docker container. So these are all separate applications and they are all connected to the, to the API gateway. And this is the common bus that connects to Fulcrum 1. So we have an identity and access management core module. We have our API gateway module. We have business rules engine module. The, this one we have designed. We have RPA module. We have augmented reality module and Fulcrum administration module. So all these modules are connected through the API gateway into one sing, sing, single bus. On the left, we have a Fulcrum administration layer. If we go to the next slide, we can see the business functionalities. Yes, so we have business functionalities on the bottom left. We have the management of accounts of your users, your content, your files. We have file libraries available. Your analytics branding, you're able to customize Fulcrum 1 visually any way you want. I'm going to show in a few slides how we do that. Uh, collaboration, so we have a permission level, we have owner level, we have collaborator level, we have visitor level. So only the owner is able to, only the owner of an object is able to assign permissions to collaborators and visitors. And collaborators can, uh, can touch the data, but visitors can only see it. Uh, this is a Manage MySQL database on Azure. Let's go to the next slide. So I'm going to explain the plugin architecture. The plugin architecture is what? Is when we really need someone to make a custom solution. So if you create an entity, let's say clients, and it is a simple entity, I'm going to put you know, ID, name, telephone. This is just a creation of an entity, it's very easy. You don't need a programmer, you can go into Fulcrum 1, you configure it and create the entity. But let's say I want something more complicated. I want a module that uh, shows a map and on that map, I can pinpoint where the client is. So this is a custom solution. We're talking about a custom solution. So this is how you install new solutions into Fulcrum 1. It is just like developing into Visual Studio and then uploading to a, to a SharePoint, but you don't have to program. In this case, an advanced business user is able to do it. So traditional development process, which is code-oriented architecture, demands a lot of effort because the developer needs to change the databases. It has to change the logic you know, in, into the application. It has to change the visual aspect of the application. And if you have workflows, if you have to validate a new field, you also have to change the workflow. So in the normal development process, 
you have one person, maybe two, two or three that have to touch all these different layers. And this is called oriented architecture. Now with Fulcrum 1, we are allowing business oriented architecture. So I'll show it to you guys on the next slide. Yeah, so uh, in Fulcrum 1, business oriented architecture, uh, an advanced business user creates an entity and Fulcrum 1 automatically generates all the basic functionalities for the entity, generates the APIs and put it on the API gateway and generates all the visual interfaces that it, you can use as a plugin into a page. And after that, all you gotta do is customize a workflow if you need a workflow. If you need a custom workflow, if you wanna validate some data, if you wanna make some calculations, you go to that entity, creates a, you create a trigger, and once the data is inputted, it's going to trigger your workflow. Let's go to the next slide. Hey, uh, Alex, five minutes to go, and then we'll take questions. So cover up uh, the, the cover the slides that in level of detail that you can in the next five, and we'll take questions. Okay, so developing as business oriented architecture, the business user creates the entities. Yeah, we have said about that. Let's go ahead. Can we go ahead? One, one, a couple more slides. Choose the templates, visual templates. Go ahead and customize workflows. So the custom plugin, we, the advanced user creates a zip package with everything he, he needs. He puts the XML file, which is a manifest file, a configuration file, and that's installed into Fulcrum on through a administration interface. Yeah, let's keep going. Okay, we can skip that. Okay, what, what, what is in, within the package? We can skip that. Yeah, so how far the package capability can be extended? Here we have a few demo screens. Okay, so how we create visual templates, entities? So to the participants on the call, essentially what you're seeing as you're skimming through these slides here is uh, you can almost visualize the fact that you create a workflow which is what we understand in the business world. You create a whole bunch of Docker, you know, container-based services. It could be on any any container management model. But then connecting wholly encompassed and encapsulated uh, business logic. You know, this was an idea from 30 years ago, which is coming to becoming real. Uh, nothing new about a workflow connecting to a service. It's been done before. What actually is special is that scalability and the whole notion of elastic cloud-based elasticity, unless you've engineered systems in a way that can truly become elastic, moving a system to the cloud in itself doesn't make it elastic. It'll live with the limitations the code was written with. But the minute you serviceize, a quote unquote, serviceize a piece of business logic, and you allow it to run in a cloud elastic container, now spawning off and spooling down depending on load becomes possible. And what you're seeing here is you are no more writing requirements to actually translate to code. You're actually dealing with the workflow. And once again, workflows are not new. There, there are many workflow engines out there from the past. But what this is subtly doing, if you notice, to the topic we had on hand, transformation and transformation-related architecture, underlying the Fulcrum 1 core is all the flexibility that we have introduced without talking about it too much without making it an artifact in itself that someone has to go translate. But the minute you start engineering systems on something like this, uh, whether you choose to go with Fulcrum 1 or not is a, is a decision you have to make. But what it does is imbibe all the principles we spoke about earlier. And Chris, you can continue to skip through the, skim through the slides as I speak, but you have introduced subtly the, the very concepts we talked about earlier without actually making it a discussion topic. We're not talking architecture on the side, and then someone has to translate it to code and lost in translation are all the principles we you know, described on an architecture artifact. But when it came down to systems engineering and application design and mobility and IoT, 
well, all of that discussion on the architecture side went the other way, and we coded the way we always coded. So this has forced us, in a subtle way, to retain all of that discussion, but build on top of it in exactly the way someone would want to build on it in a truly agile way. But then you're talking business concepts and business language in workflows, which you see on the screen now. And on the other side, you talk services. And logic is encompassed in services. Workflow gives it sequence, combined sequence and logic. And you got what you want to deliver upon a customer-focused workflow or a customer-focused outcome. We are about 10.50. Alex, what did we have after this? This was, yep, yeah, there, we, there we go. So time now at 10.50 uh, Central Time. I think we're 10 minutes for questions. Uh, if there's you know, any questions around, we're happy to take them now. So we give you all enough time to have a meaningful conversation. Sure, CJ. Uh, just taking a look at the first question that came in. Uh, how can you tell if an enterprise architecture is comprehensive? So comprehensive, uh, comprehensiveness as an architecture characteristic, I think, is a is a term that goes uh, only when it's compared against the needs of an architecture. So if you look at characteristics, I think it's easier to qualify them. So you can uh, completeness and adequacy are two elements of any enterprise's architecture, and and that actually tells you it's necessary and sufficient that there is nothing beyond what's needed to fulfill the enterprise's needs. But then there's also everything that is required to actually fulfill an enterprise's needs. So that's completeness and adequacy. So if you apply that simple litmus test, does the, do the current objectives for the enterprise, uh, whether market-focused, financial, employee-focused, customer-focused objectives, uh, revenue objectives, operations metrics, you know, those objectives, are those objectives listed? And does the enterprise's architecture meet them or position to meet those. That tells you completeness. Adequacy is it is sufficient to meet those needs. Then you come down and look at all the boxes that are not green boxed or green hashed based on the first question. You know what's overkill and should be jettisoned to lighten the, the drag on the portfolio. So I typically, when I looked at portfolios, I've measured it against the objectives of the company, not only the current objectives, but an objective set that is current plus two or three years at most. We used to go out five years at one point in time, but as, a, as an EA who's done a lot of this work, my typical approach to this has now become a current plus you know, 24 month way in a window because stuff changes so rapidly, it's meaningless to be talking 12 years out and then finding out nothing has remained the same in 12 months actually. That answers the question. Okay, uh, next question that we have. Do you have a preference for any specific framework for specific situations? How do you decide which is the right framework for you? So having been an EA and ISO 9000, so a certified EA and ISO 9000 auditor and an SEI CMM um, capability maturity assessor, I will tell you I love frameworks and a lot of my research in the past has been on, on frameworks itself. There, there are many frameworks, and I would never sit here and say to anyone there is one best framework to use for a certain reason, for a certain objective. But I've always used the approach of distilling frameworks down to what's required for the job at hand. So taking the elements of any framework, let's take an example. You take TOGAF, the architecture continuum, the application continuum that is described within TOGAF is a beautiful concept. So to apply that element of TOGAF for anything we do in the architecture world actually gives us a very strong and meaningful way of dealing with how do you describe architecture. So that's distilled out of TOGAF. Take CMM. The whole notion of CMM was based on opportunistic improvement. So when you talk about SEI CMM capabilities from Carnegie Mellon to improve the capability, the software engineering capabilities of any firm, uh, which frankly, despite the beauty of JavaScript and Python and Angular, and the fact we moved away from Koenig and Ritchie's C programming language or C sharp to some extent, uh, whether we do imperative or declarative type programming, the principles uh, espoused in uh, the SEI CMM framework have never changed. The presence of certain KPIs, the presence of uh, capability levels, 
And I don't ever believe that every company needs to be operating at level five of the CMM to be uh, to be good at what they do and to achieve success in what they're after. So when I speak about frameworks, I'm always careful. There is no one best framework, but on my radar has always been knowledge of most frameworks in the QA world. You know, you could use the Deming philosophy. You could go go the Duran way. You could use uh, defect zero defects as a model. Lean you know, approaches are, are not bad. But distilling them down to the needs of a company, uh, depending on their size. Secondly, the DNA of the firm, uh, because it must fit the organizational culture to some extent. Otherwise, I have seen, absolutely seen, more than once, that the weight of these very frameworks or models is so high that it can bring the organization to a grinding halt. So force-fitting an entire ISO 9000 implementation on some company I have seen bring the company down to a grinding halt and on the other hand, lose the spirit of the process or the model because now we're just checking the box, we're saying we're doing it. So do I have recommendations? Like I you know, named a few. These are some of the ones that I've known to apply really easily into any context. There are new ones. Agile is a classic one. The manifesto says a lot of good stuff. But if you were to apply Agile in the project world, in the world of Agile, there is no project. There is basically continual development and evolution of a seed that we sow. So the minute somebody says, who's the project manager on an Agile uh, effort, I'm looking at the table around and seeing who's going to provide a response to that because there is no concept of a project in Agile. So if we try to hybrid models together, we'll have people talking waterfall and we have they describing user stories, a total mismatch between the artifact being talked about and the model being used. Or we're talking Agile and I've seen people write software requirement spec, an artifact from the archaic waterfall development life cycle. So this mismatch will happen if we force fit a model. So my recommendation typically has been use the right model, use the right elements of the model based on where the most pain is for the organization that's in our, on hand. And then once you have constructed that framework, which is a semi-customized framework for the organization we're talking about, then you continue to use it until you find need to change or imbibe something else or, or improve upon an area that's not doing as well. Sorry for the long answer, but that's uh, in context of what we just spoke about. No problem. Uh, next question we have, what are the best practices you have used or witnessed to build for change rather than build to last, as they would say? And uh, the most of this discussion today, uh, thank you, it's a good question. And my own thinking around it continues to evolve. Otherwise, I would become obsolete at some point in time. But uh, there is nothing that the whole build to last concept, uh, I think, exists. But I think what we are building to last is not the end state item, is actually the principle set and the models based on which we create a foundation. The foundation is, should be meant to last. The artifacts built on the foundation should evolve and should be capable of evolving very, very rapidly. So my my best practice, you know, if you if you really ask me, hard to summarize them into a small set, but three things that come to my mind. One is to get really good at honing in on the need. I would say 75 to 80 percent of the time, the various failures in uh, uh, outcomes and efforts and projects are on, on account of the lack of clarity in what we want to construct. Second, uh, the second thing is to get really good at identifying who has what available for us to capitalize on or reuse. So that's number two. So first one is getting clear on what we want. Second, knowing deeply what's available and what can we capitalize on because speed is of, uh, of, of importance here and time is of the essence. Number three, building a foundation for flexibility and aggregation. And with that, of course, comes all the other things that are, if there are no standards, you can't aggregate, right? But the three things are getting to know really clearly what we want to go after. You can see enough examples of you know, the inability to describe even use cases really well. If you were to drill down deeply on most requirements written, you'll find that they're unable to be clear. Next one is to know what's available and where to find them. And the third one is to have a seamless foundation built based on what we are talking about today to plug and play in a seamless way. Those three would be the best practices where I have found most success in engineering and running a technology center 
or even in running innovation portfolios and running labs and so forth. If these three things are in place at a minimum, I believe that most of the success comes out of this. Yes, there are other aspects that could absolutely help, but without these three, the others won't help. Okay, we have about a minute left. Uh, so um, with that, I think we're gonna wrap up. Uh, if your question, if you asked a question that was not able to be addressed by one of our panelists, uh, we will be following up with you via email shortly after this webinar. And of course, if you have any other additional questions or comments, feel free to contact us. Um, you can send them out to, you can submit them through our website, fulcrumdigital.com, or you can email us directly, marketing at fulcrumdigital.com. We'll make sure that CP and Alex address any questions you may have for them. Uh, and with that, I would like to thank CP and Alex for both joining us, a very uh, informative webinar. Um, thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, any last words that you'd like to share with the audience? No, thank you very much for making the time. Uh, time is the hardest thing to find, and the fact you all have, are, are here, uh, no, no, we need to be very grateful to you for spending the time with us. And if in any way we can help you, uh, please feel free to reach out. I'm happy to answer questions via email after the session is done. So please do send them over, and we'll do our best to get back to you in a in as quick a you know, time, timeline as possible, but definitely respond to your questions. But thank you, and have a great day. Great. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, Chris. Bye-bye.